cool. All right, we can get started. It looks like people are mostly trickling in. So if a few more people join, that's okay. They'll they'll join in, in a couple minutes. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for, for coming to our very first event as part of our newly launched remote students community. Um, so, so exciting to have you all here for the first event that we're hosting on the new platform and super excited to get all of your feedback and requests and support. Um, so I guess first we'll do a quick introduction about remote students. So if you're joining us for the first time on our new platform, um, we're super excited to have you. Um, remote students is an invite only professional community platform for college students. So we're trying to help all the remote college students find internships and get support and kind of just feel more confident about your professional development goals during quarantine and during COVID. Um, so a little bit more about the event. Um, we're super, super excited to have Martin here today. Um, we had some questions that we took in advance on a post in remote students. So we'll start off with those questions um, and then we'll move into the live Q&A. So at the end of the event, um, feel free to share like your favorite insight that you learned from today on LinkedIn and tag the remote students profile. We'll go and like, like and comment and interact with your posts on LinkedIn. Um, and now that we're, we're fully live, we'd love for you to share remote students on social media and with your friends. So with that being said, um, at the end of this event, we'll actually send, uh, send you a unique invite code that will only work for the next 24 hours. And you can use that to invite your friends onto the platform and they can skip the application. Um, and lastly, we'd love for you to introduce yourself on our actual community. So within the marketing community, um, we'd love to get to know you better. So start off by making an introduction post. We'd be super, super happy to learn more about you. Um, and yeah, it looks like Andrew just sent that invite link. Um, make sure you don't post that specifically specific link on social media since whoever gets that link will be automatically accepted. So that's just for your friends and we're super, super excited to have you and your friends interacting and getting to know each other. Cool. And one last thing, we'd encourage everyone to turn on their cameras. We want this to be a, a real community. And so feel free to turn on your cameras if you feel comfortable and if you can, we'd love to see your faces. Sweet. All right. And it's my pleasure to be introducing Martin. Martin is the co-founder and CEO of Access Bell. He previously led global marketing for Flutter at Google, was an APMM on YouTube VR and a PMM at Google AI. Before Google, Martin started businesses in the events and ride sharing space back in college. Martin is on the Forbes 30 under 30 2020 list for marketing and was named Product Marketing Association's 2019 International Rising Star in Marketing. He's originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina and loves to travel. Thanks so much for having me. away for us. No, thanks so much for having me. And it's so uh, awesome to see this community you're building. Um, I'm always very passionate about, I mean, I could talk about it later, but Access Bell originally started as a, also a platform to really connect students with jobs and uh, opportunities. So I'm really passionate about this space and it's amazing that you've already built this, this strong community, which I know will continue to grow. So thanks for having me and, uh, you know, really hope that um, all of you can take something useful out of this, uh, whatever that may be. So, you know, really excited to be here. Um, so yeah, I think you asked me to give a quick uh, kind of story intro. I know we have an hour, so I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. I think that's where the real value comes in. So I'll just give a little brief context uh, uh, on myself, um, just so you can hopefully have that as you ask some questions. So um, as uh, Andrew said, I'm originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, I'm Charles Espanol, but no one ever knows that because I grew up in the U.S. most of my life. Um, so uh, very fortunate to kind of move to the U.S. at a young age. And uh, I think, you know, my parents sacrificed a lot to make that transition. And I am very grateful for that. So I think uh, everything I do in life, I kind of look back and say, hey, you know, it's amazing to get these opportunities in the first place. And I know we're going through a really hard time right now and the world, you know, is going through a pandemic. So I think it's important to just take a second every day and just, you know, realize how, how lucky we are one way or another, because I think, you know, even being part of this community, it's already a support system and a way to get opportunities, right? So I think that's really important to remember. Um, so I've always been very entrepreneurial at heart. So when I was eight years old, I started a toy company called Perfect Toys and I would kind of sell toys to my neighbors. Um, and the idea was it's amazing to be able to create value and share it with people around you. 
Um, and so kind of through my life, there's been that theme. Uh, when I was in college, I started a ride sharing app called Greek Ride. And this was before the Uber days. So the idea was let's, you know, there's fraternities and sororities on campus. I went to Indiana University in Bloomington. And we realized that, you know, they're texting out all the numbers. And it's such a crazy system, if you can think about uh, just numbers being texted to a group of people and then forwarded around, you know, 40,000 students, basically. And so uh, we decided to create an app to solve for that. And ride sharing wasn't a thing yet. So it did very well until Uber became a thing. And you can probably imagine how that one ended. Um, learned a lot uh, as you look back through these experiences, but obviously ended up shutting down that business. And what's interesting there is at that point, I was at the Kelly School of Business. So all of my friends were doing consulting, right? And they were trying to get you know, the dream, which is McKinsey or BCG or Deloitte or Bain, right? And everyone was just fixated on being a consultant. And I remember at the time, I obviously was part of that trend. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to study case interviews. I'm going to try my best to get into one of these firms. And so I interviewed with um, McKinsey, with Bain, with BCG, and I got rejected from all of them. Um, also got rejected from Deloitte. And I remember at the time, I was feeling so you know, just stress and saying, hey, I've spent the last semester or two just studying cases, like wanting this job, and I have zero offers at this point. Um, and I think it's amazing when you look back at certain moments and you realize all the things that happened because you got a rejection somewhere. And I think it's important to remember that as well during the moment because you have to, everything does happen for a reason and things end up lining up. So just, you know, as you're putting pressure on yourself for an objective, if it doesn't end up working, like happy to go into other failures I had later on because I think kind of Andrew started with some of those accolades, but of course, you know, um, it's kind of intimidating and I always suffer from imposter syndrome myself sometimes when I'm, you know, on this Forbes list and I'm looking at the people on it and I'm like, what am I doing? Right. So, uh, you know, it's very natural to feel that way. And, uh, you know, but at, anyway, what happened was after that, I decided to really follow that passion of mine, which was tech because I had already started this ride sharing app and kind of had that itch to keep going in tech. And so, you know, really, uh, continue that path and ended up uh, landing an internship at YouTube where I worked on virtual reality. So this, this was before Google launched Daydream. So we were just starting to launch the VR viewers and trying to understand what does VR even mean, right? We had those 360 videos, uh, but any video was fascinating back in the day. Like you just, a cat video was amazing, no matter if it's in 3D or not. So uh, we were trying to understand like, what is it, what, what content do we actually prioritize? What is useful for YouTube? Um, and then after that, I went back to Google full time and um, ended up uh, kind of being the first marketer on a product called Flutter, which at the time was very small. Um, in the last four years kind of uh, grew that to now over 2 million developers and hundreds of millions of, uh, of users of the product. And it's essentially a uh, software that allows developers to code apps that run on iOS, Android, and the web natively from one code base. So instead of having to, you know, you can think about Slack, for example, you have the Slack app on your, you know, each device, you have it on the web, and the Slack team has to develop that in every single time differently, right? And it's essentially the same thing, though. And so what Flutter does is it li literally lets you build it in one place, but it's fully, fully native. And so, you know, it was amazing to be able to kind of lead global marketing for that. Uh, and then, you know, along, alongside uh, COVID, I ended up uh, leaving Google to start a company um, as well as, for, you know, been pursuing my MBA uh, and that company is Access Bell, originally meant for a similar purpose as this, which is there's a lot of students uh, seeking help and seeking job opportunities. And so originally it was a Zoom, Calendly, and LinkedIn having a baby. So you can go in, you know, search for a professional, book time with them, and it would automatically send uh, Zoom links uh, to meet with them. And uh, eventually we ended up building our own video software because Zoom had a lot of limitations for us. And kind of that's where we're at now with the company. Company. It's been growing. Uh, we have some employees and it's been a kind of a crazy ride. And I'd be happy to answer questions about it for being a first time CEO or running a company or joining a startup uh, because I kind of just went through a lot of that myself, you know, and since college, I haven't experienced it because when you're at Google, you have a lot more of a cushion than when you're on your own. So, um, you know, that, that's a little bit about me. I'd love to leave the rest of this for uh, questions because I know there's probably a good amount. Awesome. With that introduction, thank you so much, Martin. Um, that, now we can introduce Jamie and Fernanda, who are going to help us moderate the Q&A portion. Awesome. Hi, everyone. We're so excited to be hosting this event today and especially having Martin answer all of your questions. As a quick introduction, I'm Fernanda. I'm a rising senior at Northeastern University studying marketing with minor in behavioral neuroscience. And I'm very excited to be part of the marketing and sales community over here. Jamie, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, of course. Hi, I'm Jamie and I'm a rising junior at Boston College. I'm studying marketing and information systems with a minor in Chinese. I'm also really, really excited to be a part of the marketing and sales community. 
Awesome. So before we start, we just want to let know, um, let everyone know actually that we're going to be choosing the questions from the forum from our website. We're going to be choosing six questions and also at the end there's going to be a live portion and we're going to put the link over in the chat. Just a reminder that if you want us to call out, you, to call you out to um, just like ask your question, make sure that you put your name as well so we know that it's not anonymous. Yeah. So and, when, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we chose these questions based on what reflects um, the community really well and to go over as many topics as we can. So, yeah, as Fernanda says, if your question wasn't chosen, please feel free to put that in the Slido um, app right there. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so our first question is from someone in our community. Hamza asks, Martin, what are some key lessons you learned in launching your startup? And if you want to maybe narrow it down to two or three, I think that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, and also, by the way, I'm happy to take live questions. So if someone asks a question in the forum or prefers to say it live or, or because you're here live, I think it should be a benefit that definitely. So happy to alternate, but I'll try and be more concise so we can get to more questions. Um, in terms of key lessons we learned, uh, so first of all, it's really hard, right? I mean, you always see the stories of the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world and you're like, okay, like, boom, just launched this company and there you go. And then all of a sudden, a week later, you're stuck deciding how does payroll work? Wait, I have to offer health benefits. What do you mean? Like there's all these, uh, you know, legal docs that I have to sign. So it's really, really complicated. And I learned that that's okay. And it's natural uh, because I think sometimes people think, oh, they just start a business and it's super easy, but there's a long journey, like 95% that you just don't ever see. Right. And so um, I think the beauty of it though, is that because it's hard, you end up learning a lot um, and you end up the second time and the third time is even easier. And so I think that's actually a benefit of starting a business, uh, even if the business doesn't go anywhere. Just the fact that you got to the point where it's a functional business is already a win, right? Um, so I'd say that's one. Uh, two is I think I've, I've learned a lot about uh, product market fit. Because when you first have an idea, you think, you know, oh, it's great for me or my friends or for, you know, maybe it's an inconvenience you have. But uh, I mean, we've pivoted Access Bell already three or four times. And I joke that we've basically built four businesses in the last two months because this started as a, uh, you know, community to connect students with professionals. And right now it's an e-commerce uh, platform to uh, be able to instantly connect with a shopper via video uh, conferencing, right? So it's a very, very different concept, but I think it's naturally, uh, we've also, by the way, kept the, the community for students going and for free and it'll always be there. So it's not like we closed that, but yes, it's definitely interesting how uh, to pivot and, and kind of learning how to do that. Yeah, thank you so much. And the next question comes from Andrew and is what are the biggest differences between doing marketing for a big tech company like Google versus a startup? I would say your budget. <laughs> Um, I joke that uh, when I worked at like led marketing for Flutter, it was like the best funded startup I'd ever worked for. It was amazing that I could launch these global campaigns and do, you know, multi-million kind of dollar uh, massive global things where now it's a very different, right? Um, I would also say, I think I was in a unique position where Flutter within Google was still kind of a startup in the sense that it's very scrappy. You know, we could launch things without going through 10 processes. But I do think sometimes there is challenging elements of working at big companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, where there are a lot of, there's a lot of red tape, right? And there might be 20 other people doing a similar thing you're doing. Um, and so I think what's important there is even if you're in that position, you can always find a way to own your own work and really like lead something end to end, right? Even if there's 20 other people doing a similar job. Uh, and so I think the key there is to always create that micro and entrepreneurial or startup environment within your own work, even if it's within a broader company. Awesome. I think that was great advice. I definitely will pull out my notebook in a second to take out notes, but if anyone else also wants to take notes, let me know. Um, Karen also asked, how were you able to persuade people to fund your startups and what resources in college did you utilize? Okay, uh, absolutely. So first of all, I think that uh, especially in college, and it's really interesting because right now, obviously with Access Bell, we are funded. We're part of the same accelerator as uh, Andrea, you know, as Andrea and Akshaya are, and um, we are lucky enough to have some really good VCs behind this. Uh, but back in college, uh, Greek ride, it was really just friends and family. So I, you know, went to my grandpa and everyone else I could find and be like, believe in me, I'm going to make the future of ride sharing. Yeah. <laughs> they were looking at me asking why I didn't have them invest in Uber instead at the time. But, uh, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, you don't actually need that much money to start up a business or a concept. Right. And in fact, we haven't tapped into much of the money because I think it's really important mm -hmm. to create that value in a scrappy way 
One of my favorite books is called The Lean Startup. Um, many of you might have heard of it, and it essentially talks about building that MVP, that minimal viable product. And essentially, the concept of that is a, what's a version of your product that requires like minimal or no funding, but that you can start getting feedback on. As long as you can start getting feedback on something, that means you can start iterating and building it with the end user in mind. And so even this platform we're using right now, right? I'm sure, you know, uh, the team has thought about, let's get first a community of students together. And then of course you can build it up and add more features and add more communities. But at first just getting that one Google form or really mm -hmm. scrap like the first version of uh, Greek ride was a, a Google form where you enter a password to see the numbers of the drivers. Then of course people got creative, started screenshotting the numbers, sending that around. So, you know, we needed an app, but uh, you get the point. So definitely, you know, building that MVP. Awesome. Thank yeah. you so much for that. Um, and the next question comes from Jessica. So how do you think that your personal network contributed to your marketing success? And do you have any networking tips for all students out here today? Absolutely. I think the word networking sometimes has this like connotation of we're basically different people when we're online versus like human beings. Right. And I think that's just where I see a lot of smiles. Right. We can all relate. You know, the hey, would you have 15 minutes of the time email, right? We all know exactly what that is. Uh, we've all been there. Um, I'm there right now, like cold emailing people for access bell, like, hey, try our product and failing drastically. So I'm not a good networker I'm in that fashion. But I think the most important thing is just to remember, like, just be, and I know it's so cheesy to say like be yourself, but like just be like candid, right? Really like get to the point sometimes and show vulnerab vulnerability. So I think like, I even, you know, I could have started this intro and said, hey, I'm Martin, I'm the rising star in marketing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm also learning, you know, the, the Forbes 30 and 30, I get asked about that a lot. I actually had no idea. I didn't know much about the list and I didn't even know I was nominated at the time. Um, and then all of a sudden I get an email from them saying like to fill out some info and I did it. And then four, four months later, I completely forgot and I get an email uh, saying I was on the list. And, and it, so it was like, you know, uh, some, I, think, I think my philosophy when it comes to networking and I know I deviated a bit is, um, I just, just always surround yourself with people that are doing really interesting things in spaces you, you're, you're wanting to be. And that goes also into that mentorship thing. Like, how do you choose a mentor? I think it's really important to think with the end in mind. So where do you want to be in five years? Map that out. Like, what does your hypothetical resume look like five years from now? You can literally write that, that, that down and then go look for people in your network or friends or family friends that have a similar resume and like connect with them. Right? Because at the end of the day, they've been there and they've probably gone through a lot of different hoops or can connect you to a lot of people in that path of where you're trying to be as well. Um, and I think that whole think with the end in mind mentality works for a lot of other things. So in business, when you're launching a product, um, what if, think about four months from now, what does that press release look like when the product launches and write it now? So then you can work backwards and make sure it gets there by that time, right? So I think like the thing with the end in mind for networking is great too. I think that's such great advice, especially because even in classes in college, when they teach you about networking, it's such this like intimidating, daunting thing when it's reality, like creating relationships. So I also loved how you mentioned the part about being vulnerable and open. And I think this question will tap into that. Um, so Hajun asks, now that you're a CEO of a company with employees, what are some of the most important skills or aspects when you choose to hire your staff and your team? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, I'm pretty tired today because we had uh, 20 back-to-back -back interviews for a specific position. And I think as a CEO, uh, one of the most important things is who you hire, right? The early, early mm -hmm. people and, and uh, the people really drive the ship forward. Um, so I think it's so important to uh, think about not just their output or their resume, but really, like you said, the human behind and, and, and their motivations and why they genuinely want to do something. Um, mm -hmm. Something else that's important is always like, again, you're, you're the, the collective of the five people you surround yourself with, right? So references from people around you or kind of impact um, is really important in looking for that. But no one's perfect either, right? And there's been cases where in every company you have to fire someone or it's just not a fit and that's completely okay as well. And so I think, uh, yeah, to answer your question, um, I'm still learning to be honest because uh, we're growing pretty quickly and I've never been in this position where I've had to hire like this. But I think the key for us is not to look just at the you know, uh, resume, but really their past behaviors and which is a good indication of their future behaviors. Yeah, Jamie, I'd like to ask a follow up question actually in here. So when you're talking about hiring, if you're sitting in front of a candidate and maybe they don't have a lot in their resume, what are some of those soft skills that you would consider into like believing that this candidate would be a good fit for your team, even if they don't have maybe the hard skills or the technical background? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I guess it also depends on what role, right? If you're interviewing for a developer and they go, well, I have no idea how to code, but I mean, they better have a really good response <laughs> after that bug. <laughs> However, um, of course, if they kind of you know, fit the bill to an extent, but maybe you're more of an underdog or you don't have the classic resume, I think you can actually use that to your advantage during an interview because I would be a lot more, it'd be a lot more memorable after these 20 back-to-backs if one of them told me like a very tangible story of a time they had this like amazing impact uh, right. Then someone just reading off the Ivy leagues they went to. And I think one of the reasons why Stanford uh, actually asks one of their essays is what matters most to you and why. And the point of that essay is to tell your actual story, not to list out your resume. Right. And so mm -hmm. I think, um, a, li a little bit more tangibly, I would genuinely think about four or five very specific stories and a lesson you learn from each of them. And you have ones about, you know, you can apply to with failures or with or time you worked with a team that didn't work like every day behavioral, but I would just have a few stories that are, that are very genuine to who you are and really show that thought process, uh, in mind. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to on the spot, come up with things that you feel like aren't really showing your true self in the limited time you have. Got it. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for telling us about that. I think what you said about having an unconventional story or resume really applies to all of us right now, like during these really unprecedented times. Um, so the next question comes from Sarah. She says, what were your, what were some of your biggest pitfalls that maybe no one saw that still helped you land where you are right now? Yeah. Pitfall. No one I saw in, in terms of, um, yeah. So just like some failures or some, some, some hardships. Yeah. Some challenges. Yeah. I mean, I guess, uh, I already told you guys about the, the not getting into kind of the consulting firms one. I think I'll, I'll say one here that I actually haven't ever told anyone, which is, um, when I started access bell, we applied to Y Combinator, um, and we got a final round and, uh, we didn't get in. And I remember at the time we worked so hard, to get that, uh, to get into that incubator. Like we, we like the, did so many practices. Like we had our pitch perfect. Like we genuinely had thought we had so much momentum and just hearing a straight no after getting into a final round like that, um, is just, it's, it's really a pain, right? At that time, I remember definitely a lot of walks around my pool, of course, you know, socially conscious, not, not near anyone, but just, you know, reflecting on what am I doing with my life? Why did I work so hard? Um, but at the end of the day, you know, now we get the, the, privilege of joining this amazing pair accelerator and getting all these other uh, you know, sponsorships. And the only reason we got that is because we didn't give up. In fact, I sent a note to the team as soon as we didn't get that offer saying, hey, you know, this is just fuel for us to just keep believing in ourselves even more and, and go even further. And I'm really proud of the team because I think all of them worked even harder ever since that they happened, not stopped, right? And so using that as fuel um, and really just continuously to believe in yourself, I think is, is really important in those pitfalls. Yeah, thank you for that. And also for being open, because I've honestly think that's one of the most helpful ways to learn, actually, like looking at actually like the pitfalls or not the big success story. So that was really helpful. Um, we have some also backup questions since we've been going like through them pretty quickly. And then we can move into live Q&A. But Lucent asks, when communicating with respective target users for your different startups, do you have a specific method to make sure that you are asking the right questions and truly understanding your users' pain points? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of my favorite books as well, by the way, it's called Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And he's an incredible author. You've probably all seen some of his talks, um, professor as well. And the whole concept is when you're starting a business or, or doing something, it's really you have to start with the insight first. Like, why is it that you're doing it, right? Um, and so I, even like this remote students, right? I can tell Andrew and, and Akshaya and, and the team like really have that why, which is so purposeful. It's so powerful to even be in the Zoom call and see your faces and, and, and see this community forming. And I think that's key when you're starting a business because if you have your why intact, then the reaching out and the getting the customers becomes easier because you know that that's an insight that they want. Um, also, when you're reaching out to customers at first, what's most useful is actually to reach out for feedback rather than to pitch to them. Uh, because first of all, the whole dynamic of the conversation will be they want to help you, not they want to see if this works for them. Um, and in turn, you might actually end up landing a lead from them. And if not, the key is to always ask what are two or three other people you think I should talk to at the end. Because if they're within the range of what you want to be doing, and this goes with networking too, if you have an incredible mentor you talk to or someone you look up to, ask them, hey, who are two or, the three, two or three other people you think I should talk to based on now that you know me, right? That trick is just like always, always, you know, be getting those additional leads or additional people to talk to it really leads you down the right focus area. 
Um, and, and happy to, by the way, I know we've done a lot of uh, set questions. So if anyone has any live questions, maybe we can take one or two now just to go back and forth between live and, uh, and written. Yeah, totally. We can definitely transition into getting the live questions. So um, I'm just going to read them out in order. And um, if your camera is on, you can feel free to ask it yourself. So uh, the first question is actually anonymous. So I'm going to ask, uh, what was the process of interviewing at Google like? You go in a room, they ask you how many ping pong balls fit into the airplane and you leave. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, what was it like? So I mentioned I did an internship at YouTube. Uh, and so I had like that internship and then there was a whole conversion process. So it was a little bit different at the time, but definitely not the, uh, the typical stereotype. Um, I think that, you know, interviewing at Google, they really want to understand um, how you think about problems. So there's not a right answer at the end of it, but it's your thought process. Uh, I guess one it's the typical, you know, behavioral plus some case questions, but I'll give you guys one trick that I think really served me well in interviews that I believe um, you might want to use. So whenever you get asked an interview question, um, a lot of times most candidates just go right into the answer. And uh, I'm going to give you an example and, and show you how I apply this. So let's say, you know, I used to be a brand ambassador for Google. So I used to, you know, back in college, I was like one of those people that would hand out swag to get friends, right? Um, but basically, I, you know, Google would fly me off the Mountain View and then, and then let me be a rep for them. And during um, you know, an interview, let's assume they ask you, hey, let's say you want to launch this brand ambassador program yourself as a marketer. You know, what would you do? If, that, if That's the question, right? I think a lot of candidates would immediately say, oh, well, you know, I would go and pilot it at one school and then look at like, the budget and see how, how it goes there and then go to the next school. And that's a good answer. However, I think putting an entire layer of depthness behind that before and showing them that you're really thinking through the question itself is more powerful. So instead, if you answer, okay, well, let's take a step back and understand why we're launching this in the first place. Is it to increase candidates for Google? Is it just to get general people brand awareness of Google higher? Because depending on what the objective is, you know, it will make me want to uh, decide on the path forward more differently, right? And so making it more interactive like that and initially questioning the question and really showing them that you're thinking a layer behind it instead of just diving into let's pilot this, like you're really asking the why is key in an interview. And I think that can apply to many questions. So that's, you know, again, one example of it, but uh, yeah. Awesome. I'm going to ask the next most popular question. So a question that people want to hear your answer. Um, so is there something in your childhood that propelled you to where you are today, even if it sounds surprising? Yes. Um, in my, that's a good question. Uh, so Obviously, moving, you know, moving to the US uh, was a big change. Um, I was pretty young, but, but just adapting to a new culture and, and, you know, growing up in a system that my family wasn't used to and forced me to just be resilient and, and, and adapt and kind of figure out, you know, things. So I think that was a big uh, life indicator. I would say that, uh, I would say, so there's an exercise I like to do that, that was taught to me when I was young. So when I was in middle school, uh, we went to class once and a teacher said, hey, you know, why don't you guys all bring a little picture of yourself as kids, as toddlers to class tomorrow? We had no idea why. We didn't really think much of it. So we're like, okay. So we go and we bring this uh, small wall sized picture of ourselves printed out to class the next day. And the teacher tells us to look at that picture and he says, hey, you know, in life, you're going to be faced with a lot of challenges, a lot of important decisions, uh, you know, a lot of stressors. I want you to hold on to this. And whenever you're faced with those, I want you to look at it and ask yourself if you're going to, if you're making this little kid proud. And I thought that was a really powerful exercise because it's a way for you to kind of look at yourself as a kid when you were you know, naive and, and the world is your limit and imagination is everywhere and just make sure you're recalibrating it a little bit. And I don't have my wallet on me or I would show you unfortunately, but um, in my wallet, I still have that picture for the last 15 years uh, of me as a kid. And whenever I look at it, it's like a tangible reminder every day. So take a step back to be grateful, to you know, make sure I'm going the right path, I'm working on the right things, I'm interacting with the right people. And I think that it doesn't have to be a picture. It could be a background on your phone, a picture. It could be your watch. And whenever you look at it, it's a reminder. But I think having that tangible item that constantly reminds you to take a breath, like be grateful, you know, meditate, uh, see if directionally you're headed the right way because life sometimes is so go, 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 um, has been really impactful on my life. And I hope that hearing this, uh, maybe some of you start having, you know, those little kid pictures as well. Great. Thank you so much for that answer. So the next question comes from Michelle Ko. If you would like to ask a question on Zoom, please unmute and ask. Yeah, I'd love to. 
Hey Martin, I'm Michelle. I'm a recent UC Berkeley grad in, in tech investment banking. And um, for me, I'm, I'm super interested in the e-commerce space as well as kind of like consumer engagement tools. So I think what you're doing with your um, current tool is super interesting and um, just how to follow up, on, follow up on kind of what you mentioned and how you learned how to be scrappy and kind of manage the pivots you've done. You've mentioned that you've done like four pivots across probably like just a few months. Um, is it and like how do you kind of adapt to the changing trends and assess that product market fit in like such a short amount of time? Great question. Yeah. So earlier I talked about start with why. And so when I say, um, I do want to make the distinction that we still have the same mission of the company. Um, and I read that out every week we have an all hands and we always start with the mission when during those all hands to so remind ourselves, why are we doing this in the first place? And our mission at Access Bell is to eliminate friction virtually for people, right? So that instant connection. Um, and I, th that initially was in the form, which it still is in the COVID platform of connecting students initially with with um, others, right, with professionals. But now we're finding other ways to connect people instantly in their shopping experiences, in their e-commerce, when they're purchasing services, and they don't want to have to type 20 million times back and forth or have to pop on an external link. We want that like instant virtual world to really bring the human into the virtual world. And so to answer your question, I think when I, you know, I obviously don't want to come across as like, hey, this guy's crazy. Like, you know, they get money and they pivot five times and they're doing something different because we are still doing like a same mission. But in terms of when do we pivot, um, at the end of the day, we are running a business, right? And so um, as much as I would love to genuinely only do this kind of COVID initial platform we did because I love helping students, um, we do need to also identify where is that business opportunity that also fits our mission. And um, the reason we are gravitating towards um, e-commerce is because we feel that right now kind of retail is dying and that's a space that really needs help, but also it benefits people when they're able to get more support on their items and buy things they actually want. It's also full circle on Perfect Toys because I did start with a toy company when I was eight, but that's besides the point. Um, but besides that, we also have some clients in a few other verticals. So we're talking to people in telemedicine um, and a few others that also are interested in our kind of flexible video tools. So it is cool to start seeing that impact that's all across that mission. So I would say, you know, we pivot when we, if the current direction is clearly a dead end or just like really not bringing in leads, or if, you know, I don't say we changed, I said we pivot, right? So a lot of the business is the same. Like we just, you know, start molding it to make sure it fits what the customers continuously are telling us we want. And so um, definitely based on constant feedback, uh, where the revenue potential is and uh, making sure it sticks to your mission. Awesome. Thank you. And I, sorry, I have a quick follow-up. I know there's a lot of questions after, but um, in line with when, how, how did you kind of learn how to be scrappy? Like you've worked at Flutter, which is a really small group. Um, and like, you need to manage like kind of these ongoing changes. Is it kind of looking at customer feedback constantly, or do you have like your own system in place that you usually like to go about this, whether that be resources or how you go about your steps? Yeah, I think there's a good balance between like, the, like just going, like once you have 70% of the info you need, just doing it instead of waiting to the hundred. So a lot of times it's like aim, aim what is it? Shoot fire or what, you know, whatever the analogy is, I'm, that, that basically you go and then you can start calibrating, right? Like with Greek ride, we could have waited a year and created a beautiful app and then launched it. But no, we launched the scrappy version and we started building. And so I think just having that mentality that at the end of the day, we're all, we're not even physically anywhere these days, right? So like, there's no limit, no one telling you over your shoulder that literally can't what to do. And so just using that and saying, hey, I'm just gonna do this. I'm just gonna get involved with the startup and start putting output, of course, with data, like I said, but oftentimes just, you know, 80% of life is just showing up, uh, you know, as Woody Allen said. And so just show up uh, to the work and just put it out there and, and start getting feedback. Awesome, thank you. So now we have Sarah, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. I'm Sarah. I'm studying international business and marketing with a minor in French at the University of South Carolina. Um, so I was wondering right now, especially with COVID and us having so much time at home, um, I've been trying to expand my, I'm so sorry, one second. Um, I've been trying to expand my network on LinkedIn and being able to take more of these opportunities professionally. So I was wondering for you, um, did you ever have to convince someone to take a significant professional chance on you? And how did you do it and how did it impact you today? Yeah, it's tricky because it's, it's hard, especially if you send 50 emails and, you know, 50 come back, don't come back. 
but sometimes that 51st would have. Um, and I love that image of the miner that's like giving up and then there's just a little bit left until he gets all the diamonds, right? Um, but, but it is tricky. And I think at the end of the day, transparency of why you're reaching out from the beginning is important. So obviously finding common ground, hey, we both went to Stanford or hey, we, you know, I noticed you wrote this article about X, Y, and Z and I had that passion. Um, and then having the asks and being proactive about like make, making their life easier. Like Jerry Maguire would say, help me help you, right? So think about when you're writing an email to someone or a note, think about being them and just be like, what do they want? Like, what will they want, want me to do to make their lives easier? So I oftentimes get, I get, you know, a lot of messages on LinkedIn uh, for various reasons. And the ones that really stand out to me are the ones that one, they're, they're showing me what value I get out of it. And it doesn't necessarily mean like I have to get everything out of it, but if it, if it means like, Hey, I genuinely feel like I would learn so much from X, Y, and Z because of you. That's value because I feel like I'm helping someone, right? Or if it's something like, hey, I want to help for free on this one thing because I have for X reason. Um, let me just help you for free. No, no strings attached for a week. And then we'll talk, right? I mean, why not? Uh, you have nothing to lose. And of course, people, you know, if they're not taking you on the offer, then they're not someone you should be talking to. But you can get scrappy and creative. Um, and then one more thing I'll say about scheduling the one of the reasons we made Axabel originally is I just find it so hard to schedule. Like you, you know, there are these tools out there, but just what's your email? What time? Let me know what, when it works for you. And like the act of them going on the calendar, having to put your email in and schedule it is really hard. And so sometimes just literally being like maybe after one interaction, but saying, here's my number here are five times that work for me. Feel free to call me at any of them. Like there's no friction for them about scheduling. They can just call you during that time can, can go a long way. I think. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Samir. So uh, please unmute. Let me quickly read it again. Um, oh yeah, so um, my question for you was, you said you worked at like two very comfortable jobs, um, Google and uh, YouTube. And um, one of the things that I've been learning just on like my professional journey is that those jobs pay really, really well. And so what was it like uh, completely walking away from that job and starting your own company, uh, even though you were in a super comfortable place um, in life. In the middle of the pandemic too, my family thinks I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's because I was in a comfortable spot, not even though. Um, I feel like in life, especially in your 20s or 30s, it, you have to take the most risks because life gets hard after that. I mean, especially if you're gonna have a family or pay a more, more, a mortgage or tax, you know, it just gets more and more complicated. And so I feel like it's kind of like a reverse triangle, right? In your twenties and in your twenties, it's the biggest one where you want to get as many experiences as possible at as many different types of companies or roles as you can. And then over time you start narrow scoping yourself and really understanding where is your superpower and where do you enjoy the most? Because for me, Yes, I was at Google and it was super comfortable and Flutter is amazing. It really pained me to leave. I was the fate. If you go on the flutter.dev website right now, you'll see literally on their homepage, I'm still there as the intro tutorial video on how Flutter works, right? So um, I was able to travel around the world, like give keynotes everywhere. And it was, it was an amazing experience. And even a lot of my friends were like, Martin, you're crazy for, for leaving this. Um, obviously, you know, I, I think the, the, the pandemic just changes the landscape in general. So take some of this with a grain of salt. But uh, the answer to your question is, you know, it is, it is, not an easy decision, but I think when you take a risk, as long as it's something that you're really passionate about, as long as you're obviously economically okay in the sense that it's not like if you know you can't put bread in the table if you take this, um, and as long as it's something you feel like you're you know haven't learned actually or something that will provide that learning for you, um, I say go all in. Thank you. Awesome. Next question is from Sophia. If you want to mute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Yeah, thank you. So I was wondering if you had any advice about seeking opportunities for impact, maybe at larger companies or if you're placed on a team with an established product or if you have more of an entry level, how you keep track of your impact at a larger company and how you seek opportunities for impact. Great question. When I uh, joined Google, Obviously, I was the only marketer at Flutter, so I had a lot of impact in that realm, but I still wanted to pursue other opportunities. So honestly, what I did, I'll give you a few examples and you can apply this to your role. Uh, one was, I really was interested in AI. 
um, in Google AI and applications of AI. I didn't know much about it, but I was interested in it and I wanted to learn. And so I found internally, once you're at a company, it's easy to message people and, and somehow find time with them. So I literally found time to meet with uh, this guy, Matt, who's, who's fantastic, a big mentor for me. He writes uh, speeches for Sundar for the CEO, just to give you context. So it was not easy to reach him at first, but I reached him and I said, hey, listen, like I love 15 minutes with you, uh, you know, super fascinated with AI. Here's what I'm doing. Uh, let me know. And we talked. And I just told him what I'm interested in doing and how I want to help in my, you know, extra time outside of Flutter. And he goes, okay, interesting. Two weeks later, he goes, hey, Martin, um, can you buy a ticket to China for next week? Um, we're having an AI conference. I need help leading the, the keynotes and, and with the slide decks and everything. I'm like, okay, you know, uh, book the ticket. The next, you know, three days later, I was on a flight to, to Shanghai and had this incredible experience, uh, the global world AI conference in China and got to help work with all the key, keynote speakers for Google. Um, after that, I said, hey, you know, I still like AI. How can I keep getting involved? I also know Spanish. Uh, hablo español perfectamente. Like I'm fluent. So what can I do? So I ended up going and uh, my team actually at Access Bell always makes fun of these videos because uh, they found them somehow. But I went and I translated videos to Spanish on how to code in AI in TensorFlow. And if you look up Martin TensorFlow Spanish, you'll find them. But uh, basically, it's literally me in a green screen just talking about this. And, you know, developers in Spain and Latin America were really excited because finally they have content they can relate to and start building. And that was literally me just going, Hey, I speak Spanish. Like, is this an interesting project? And Google's like, sure, why not? Right. So I think just like thinking about what is it that you're interested in once you're at these companies and, and you know, how can it drive value to the business? Of course, like AI is for TensorFlow. So it was valuable to Google. Um, you never know. I mean, just, just go for it. Got it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And the next question comes from Edith. Please unmute and ask your question. Hi, my name is Edith. I go to Dallas College and my major is psychology and I'm still trying to figure out my major in a way. But my question was, what are some routines and habits you follow that you recommend others trying out in order to be more able to thrive in life? Good question. Um, I always, I try to always uh, take, as I mentioned with the little kid proud thing, like a few minutes or seconds a day at least to just do a full body scan or meditate or, or ground myself. Um, I try to in the mornings um, write down or at least, you know, on my phone or at least think about a few things I'm grateful for. Um, and a few things I'm looking forward to. And a lot, I know actually a lot of friends that do this deliberately. So they, they have a journal next to their bed and every night or every morning, they will write down five things they're grateful for, five things they look forward to. And I think this is an incredible exercise to not only ground yourself, but also really be grateful for what's coming up, um, especially in these hard times. So that's a great one. Um, other habits, I mean, definitely... I exercise every day. I try and run as much as I can or, you know, get out there. Um, it's so important even for your brain just to take breaks and um, be able to, to exercise. So at some form or shape or the other, I love to read uh, or even listen to podcasts if things are busy. So happy to send through either now or after like some recommendations I have for, for podcasts and books that, that I really enjoyed. Um, I think that's important. Socializing. I mean, obviously it's different times now, but uh, definitely finding ways to still have weekly or, or meetings with friends, literally just to catch up. I mean, sometimes you have to put on your calendar because life gets busy, but I think it's important with your three best friends, just having something in the books so that you make sure you actually catch up with them when things get busy. Um, it just makes, makes life a lot easier. Awesome. Next, we have Olivia's question. Hi, um, I'm an incoming freshman at Harvard. I'm interested in studying computer science. I wonder what you see as the future of virtual interactions in terms of networking, learning, e-commerce, which is probably more uh, relevant to you. And what do you see as missing from current technologies that allow for these interactions? So I think shameless plug, Access Bell is the future of e-commerce. You heard it here first, folks. Um, I, I think that uh, there's gonna be more and more technologies, obviously for remote, cases, hence the name of this entire organization that we're on right now. Um, I think that the uh, ability to not get overwhelmed. So I don't know if you guys saw recently, it blew up everywhere, the mm-hmm uh, slide, slideshow company. Some of you are nodding and laughing. There's this company called mm-hmm, like M-M-H-M-M, -M -M, hilarious name. They basically made a, a software where you can like interactively basically have a, your own TV show essentially as you're having meetings. So like you can make yourself smaller, pull things up here, like broadcast it and, and a PowerPoint. And it's just 
it's uh, yeah, it's super interesting. Someone just sent the link uh, on the chat. You can check them out. But I think like more creative ways like that that just makes it fun to be online uh, is definitely where it's headed as, as well as frictionless solutions. Um, you mentioned your, your you know, major in computer science. I think a lot of e-learning um, now more than ever is more accessible, which is amazing. In fact, I'm uh, you know, helping out. Um, there's this company a friend of mine's running called Code From Zero. Uh, Dot com and they, they just started it recently um, and they are an incredible only eight hour course in programming um, so it's just a weekend basically and you learn Python from zero so without any knowledge they kind of they're the guys that have sat in all those programming boot camps and said hey 80% of this is fluff let's only do what actually matters to get you to know the basics of coding um, so highly recommend in fact I asked them uh, because of this I actually asked them if you sign up um, and say remote students on the promo code uh, they could give you 50% off um, if you're interested in trying that, that coding class, um, I think they have, they haven't listed their upcoming classes, but I thought it would be nice. A lot of people ask me like, where do I start to code? Because I obviously did a lot of developer marketing work and I think they're actually a really good program for that. Um, so just wanted to fill out. There's a lot of other coding resources, by the way, I know this is a little tangential, but, um, and other e-learning as well. So if you just Google like COVID free classes and start looking, there's actually a lot of also free resources. Um, that I think are great to take advantage of. And so I think, again, to kind of subtly answer your question, the whole e-learning space is going to keep blowing up and access to education, I think, is going to be very incredible. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And the next question comes from Nick Hill. Hi, yeah. Um, so I am a rising junior at Northeastern University in Boston, majoring in computer science. Um, and my question is specifically regarding to something you talked about, um, which is your like, you know, your, your five year plan, where do you want to be five years from now? And as students, you know, as, um, um, as undergrads, we are obviously always thinking about that. So I wanted to ask kind of what value you thought um, um, an MBA, you're obviously doing your MBA at Stanford. Uh, why did you decide to pursue that? And what, what advice would you give to us as we decide um, whether to go for grad school, whether it's in, you know, whether it's in CS or uh, MBA or anything like that, or whether to go into the workforce straight after college? Thanks for that. And a uh, little shameless plug for Nikhil, who is one of our interns at Access Bell. He's crushing it. So thanks for joining here as well. Um, yeah. So in terms of, uh, you know, yeah, when to go to grad school, I think that, I mean, everyone has different opinions and I respect everyone's opinions on this. Uh, personally, I'm one of the people that loves uh, going, like learning. Uh, and I know it's kind of contradictory because you have all these uh, founders and CEOs that go, you know, I, school's not for me. I'm so excited to just work on a company. Um, I think that there's a kind of this curve and it, it's, there's not a coincidence why most MBA students are in their kind of later 20s, like average age is usually 27, 28. Because I think there's this curve where kind of you go to school and usually you're just like, okay, I, I'm doing this to get a job, like figure my life out. And then you get a job and then four years in, you're like, oh, this is, this is hard. It's really you know, tiring. I, what I would kill to go back to college and just be able to hang out with friends and learn. Right. And then um, a lot of people go to grad school, but I think that's fabulous because then you have that exposure and experience to already having worked. And so that's why I'm a big advocate to kind of working before you do an MBA or some sort of uh, grad degree. Um, certain grad degrees make sense to go right into it. Like, you know, certain CS ones or accounting, or um, I think for personally for an MBA, I definitely wanted to get a lot of this work experience um, and not go right into an MBA because I also studied business undergrad. Maybe it's different if you study CS undergrad and go into an MBA. Uh, but to answer your question, I don't think there's a right answer. And I do think that the, the landscape is changing a lot when it comes to uh, master's degrees. Um, that because there's a lot of things even like Lambda school and kind of these programs that you can do uh, micro degrees in and you can learn without having to take that because it is a hefty financial burden to do some of these programs. Um, and so I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to why you're doing it. And I don't think the answer should be to be able to put an MBA on your resume. I think the answer should be either for the network or really to learn like finance or marketing for the first time because I never really got the formal training or to meet with world-class professors. Because at the end of the day, um, I don't see life as like a ladder and like you have to get your MBA to get the next one. I see it like this. Um, I could easily have just kept going on Google and kept doing tech jobs and climbing that. And for me, the MBA also, that whole experience is more about, this is a life experience that no one can ever take away from me. Um, someone can fire me, someone can, you know, tell me to switch jobs, but that experience of meeting people in an MBA program or whatever educational program, even this remote students community is something no one can ever take away from you. Um, and so that's kind of how I, how I look at it. Thanks. Now get Great. Back to um, <laughs> <laughs> um, next up we have Maria.
Maria, would you like me to ask a question? Okay, I'll ask her a question. Uh, Maria asked, who are your greatest supporters? Yeah, um, so there's, uh, you know, my, my girlfriend's actually on this call somewhere. So she's a big supporter of mine, my family, uh, my close friends. Um, you know, I think that, you know, like, man, I wish that everyone I met, I could be best friends with. I'm one of those, right? Like, I love meeting people. Uh, obviously, it's hard because life has those circles where it's like, you have your buddies, you know, I think I, I once saw a really funny poster of like the circles of uh, and how they described each each layer, um, right? But at the end of the day, uh, my biggest supporters, um, you know, obviously, my family and really close friends, a lot of times people will see me as this Google guy, or I once met someone who goes, oh, you're not an AI bot, like you're, cause they see all these YouTube videos about me and they realize I'm actually a human being. And like, even you, you see this a lot with actors sometimes where they have all these public personas when you kind of do a lot of uh, things at companies. And then all of a sudden you realize they're actually very different people than you, than you think they are. And so I think, um, you know, it's, it's really good to, to remember who are your family or, and friends that no matter what happens, um, kind of are always there for you. Uh, and so especially with friends, I mean, family's obviously, you know, there for you, but uh, with close friends, it's just, uh, you know, I have a, a set of childhood friends that we just, you know, always talk about things. He, one of my best friends is a saxophone player in New York City and we couldn't be more different, but we talk like every single week and he's, you know, one of my best, best friends and he's one of my biggest supporters. So I would say, you know, uh, you know, especially nowadays when, when it's hard, like after this talk, if you learn, if, if, if one thing you get out of it, I would say like, please mark your calendar right now just to call two or three of your friends this weekend. Um, just check in on them, like be like, hey, even maybe friends that you haven't talked to in a bit, but that they, they've been with you for a while. I think they would really appreciate it because just getting that random call for no reason, just to check and on someone is actually re really worthwhile. And I honestly should get better at that too. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question actually comes from Andrew. <laughs> hey Martin, I was wondering if you went back to college, if you could go back to becoming a, a freshman or sophomore, what would you do differently, if anything? I would definitely read more. There are so many amazing books that open up your mind. And I know when you're in school, it's hard to also read and, and listen to podcasts, but you know, I'll give you an example. There's this audio book called uh, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. This guy's amazing. He became the number one Navy SEAL in the US and grew up with like all the worst cards. And it's just his life, life story. And I was so inspired by that one audio book that I, ran up my first half marathon ever. And I had only ran three miles before that. Right. And so like having those more, more of those types of resources. Um, and again, I'm happy to list out more later. Um, I would have taken more advantage of that early and then being able to apply it through, through, through my college career too. Um, something else, I think I would have, I, I think I did a pretty good job of like of, of doing um, in terms of creating, but I, I think I learned more from all of my startups in college than I did from all my classes. So maybe finding even more ways to get involved with other startups, whether it's just advisory or, you know, not just do Greek ride, but like getting hands-on experience. I think what you could do in terms of any project, whether it's, you know, a business or even like a community you're building, you'll just learn so much from it. So just getting that hands-on experience. Um, what else would I have done differently? I mean, I wouldn't have been so obsessed over the consulting thing. I think that's drained a lot of my energy and time. And I was like so narrow focused because that's what all my friends were doing. And I didn't realize there's a whole other world out there. But since I was in business school and surrounded by all these people, that's only I was focused on. So I would have like slapped myself a bit and be like, yo, like chill out. You know, um, there's all this other, 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 other paths for you. <laughs> awesome. We have time for one more question and I'm going to do a shameless plug and ask my own question. Um, what is one thing along with that you wish you would have done in college? Like you wish people knew at our point in our lives. So more of like something that a lesson that we could have learned, whether it has to do with career or with personal. I know you talked a lot about relationships and, and basically accomplishments and things maybe that you were cut up, but what is like one skill or something that you wish you would have developed? Yeah, so I'll, oh, I'll, I'll do that in two parts. I'll do one skill and one kind of lesson or philosophical one. Skill, um, I think awesome. pro programming, to be honest. So I'm not a programmer by trade. I didn't major in computer science. I did a minor in some boot camps, but it was really hard for me later on to have to like catch up instead of ride that wave. And so that's why I said code from zero, but like having even just one like code from zero or a few of those classes under your belt and just enough to understand the concepts earlier on, I think are very helpful because everything in the world now is, is digital and involves some sort of programming, even in theory, even if you're not actually coding. 
coding all day. And so some of these classes that teach the fundamentals on a, on a basic, there's one more called CS50. It's a Harvard's free introductory to computer science course. It's a lot longer. It's not like eight hours like code from zero, but it's really good for the fundamentals. So I wish I took advantage of more of those kind of tech and realized it's not actually that hard. It's like so intimidating when you hear, when I used to hear coding, I'm like, oh my God, like that's a whole, yeah. thing and I'm not good at it. And there's actually, a lot of low-hanging fruit and then you hit the wall and then it's like okay you can stop there unless you want to be a programmer but getting to that wall is actually not that hard and courses like code from zero um really help get there or other things like like these these uh, philosophical ones so i i wish i took more of those to be honest um in terms of like life i wish i realized earlier how reachable people really are and at the end of the day how they're not there aren't really rules in life like we put these like self-imposed rules of hey these this person's a vp in this company so there's no way he has time for me but maybe that person he or she are just sitting in their couch and they do see your message You're like okay i'll talk to them right so you just um never know so i would say like like just don't put those limits and you already have the no so i would just really keep reaching out, be genuine, try and find that connection or make, make it so that you feel like a human to them and not just like one of 20 other kind of emails that you probably sent to many people. And, you know, you just never know where, where that takes you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and for answering so many questions. I'm going to let our team step in um, for conclusions and just tell you a little bit more about us. Yeah, and I'll say just one more thing. Uh, just thanks everyone, obviously, for being here. Um, you know, it's Friday night and afternoon, so I, I realize that, and I appreciate you being here. And you know, I will. Uh, you know, I, you can add me on on Twitter uh, or you know, uh, DM me there if you want, or you know, uh, send me an email if needed. And I'm happy to you know connect. Obviously, things are busy, but uh, you know, I really hope you learn something from this. And thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, I'm sure there were so many amazing, insightful things from this event, and I'm sure all of you are wondering how you can keep practicing those things and stay connected and active and kind of make what you want to do in your career happen. Um, so a few things that maybe we as remote students can help you with is um, one, I mean, if you want to just connect with all the other students in this Zoom and talk to each other about the things you've learned and how you can help each other, we've started a discussion thread on the remote uh, um, inside the marketing and sales community. So Andrew will send a link right now and hop, feel free to hop in after the event and talk to each other and kind of share all the insights and tips that you've learned. Um, um, and also feel free to share anything about this post and, and tag Martin and tag remote students on LinkedIn or on Twitter. We will totally go and like retweet and share and like and engage with your social media posts. Um, and feel free to also let your friends know about remote students. The larger and more helpful this community is, the more resources we can share and help each other get through this really scary quarantine period and actually get to that next step in our career goals. Um, so yeah, the, the last thing is, um, uh, let us know if you have any feedback or, or suggestions or things that you think we should be doing. Um, and huge, huge thank you to Fernanda and Jamie for moderating this Q&A. Um, they, they love talking about marketing and sales, and they've been posting really actively in the marketing and sales community. So go off and engage with them as well. They're here to help you just the same as we're all here to support each other. So thank you so, so much again, Martin. And we'll follow up with you to get some of those podcasts and book recommendations, see if you can post those as well in the marketing community on on the remote students platform. And then, yeah, thanks again. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend. Thanks so much, Martin. Thanks, have a good one. Thank you.